Hello, everybody, and welcome to Robert Keegan and Walter chatting non-duality. Robert Keegan is the founder of the Non-Duality Victoria BC group on Facebook and a meetup group. Also, he has a book called As I See It. And you have another book too, Robert, is that right? Yeah, the first one was um, Logic of God. Logic of God. Yeah. And that one's on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it was self-published, so it's, you know, it, it's hit and miss where you might find it. Yeah. All right. Well, I got uh, As I See It. Uh, and is that is that available too, or is that just in the... No, it, it's not actually published. I, I had it to the point where I had, I got the ISBN number and all that, but uh, just ran out of money and stuff like that. So whatever, <clears throat> didn't work. Whatever. Is yeah. there any, anything else uh, you'd like to let people know about how they can find you or hmm. where not you're really. sharing this message, so to speak? Uh, just the well beyond beyond non-duality and uh, there's a couple of uh, Facebook sites that I seem to post on, you know. Yeah, great. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's jump in. I, I'm just going to go through some of the highlights from your book. Uh, it's quite a story. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just highlighted some things that I thought were pertinent to this type of. Uh, interview so the first one that jumped out was your let's see i'm going to try to do it this way yeah so um it says this is the opposite of what everyone else was saying it confused and bothered me for years until i read the power of now and eckhart Tolle spoke of sin as missing the mark I have since interpreted that as missing the essential fact of who and what I am. So is there anything you could say about who and what you are or how this um, well, shift you got in perception? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am nothing. <laughs> Talking to nothing. Um, no, it, um, it, it just took the personal side of things away like there's no person really and, and no you know no no real personality other than the character you know so <laughs> that was uh i always kind of felt that way anyway you know so yeah no separate person other than the character yeah yeah and what is the character that's it's a the DNA and the made up stories and the, <laughs> yeah, the downloaded belief systems and all that. That's what the character is. Oh, I see. These stories I can see. Um, you say enlightenment. I set about to find it with the same enthusiasm I had mustered to build my successful business. Um, so you really had a a fervor and an enthusiasm for seeking enlightenment. Oh yeah. I mean, that was, you know, I had, I had a check for 5 million bucks and I had, you know, all, all these women and all this, everything else. So, okay. So now what, you know, <laughs> in fact, it was funny. I was standing on the golf course or at the, on the driving range, uh, about, four or five months after selling the business. And, and one of my friends who was in the financial planning business came up and said, so Bob, he says, uh, so he says, now you got all this money. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> and it was like, it's, I, it just felt like a dagger was pushed into my chest. I just, oh, I have no fucking idea. You know, <laughs> and, and from then on, that's when the, you know, the book after book after book and videos and trying to, trying to uh, conquer this enlightenment thing. And you talk about um, uh, personal development. You were a junkie. Yeah. Anthony yeah. Robbins, Wayne Dyer, Stephen Covey, yeah. uh, Seven Habits. Uh, yeah. 
So what can you say about the personal development years? <laughs> well, I was always into that. Um, I always thought that, you know, I could do better or could, could be a better person and all that. So it was like, um, I don't know, that was just all the interest I had was in, it was in going and improving myself, you know, and that was, <laughs> that was all the interest I had. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you made a shift from personal development. And then you said, um, I began devouring books on the impersonal side of the coin, so to speak. Books and tapes by authors such as Alan Watts, UG Krishnamurti, Wei Wu Wei, Lao Tzu, Nisargadatta Maharaj, Ramana Maharshi, Wang Po, and many others. And you started several study groups on the power of now and Krishnamurti's first and last freedom. And, uh, and David Hawkins as well. Yeah. Yeah, you did a lot with David Hawkins and A Course in Miracles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, in the story, okay, <laughs> um, I was walking around with the chapters, which has become indigo or something like that now. Um, just wandering around and I look up and I see this blue book wrapped in plastic kind of I thought it was falling off the shelf actually but it wasn't but so I pulled it off and it's it's the course of miracles um and you know look like at this thick and uh I took it home and I took the wrapper off it was 35 bucks or something I forget and I started reading through it and it was Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus this <laughs> I put it on the shelf, and uh, so I just left it there for months, and finally, I came across David Hawkins, who, according to him and others, brought the course to Sedona, and he was in the same uh, group groups as Helen Shookman, who apparently downloaded the course. This is the story. and. Uh, he was. He would bring students in to test for uh, kinesiology, which um, that's his famous thing was the uh, the, the uh, what was it called the map of consciousness. It was his map of consciousness, and everybody apparently tested um, negative to negative stimuli, sorry, and they couldn't hold their arm up if, if they were. Um, under the influence of drugs or tobacco or even fluorescent lights, they were not, they would lose their, their strength. So he, anyway, he's testing these students that were in the course, in Helen's course, I guess she was just down in the same building. And none of them tested uh, negative to this stimuli. Well, the other thing was he used to hold meetings and he would, him and Lionel, Linus Pauling, the vitamin C guy that uh, won some Nobel Prizes and stuff. And they would hand out envelopes to say, I don't know, three, 400 people in the audience. And half the envelopes had vitamin C and half the envelopes had NutraSweet. And he would ask them to hold the, hold the envelopes to their solar plexus and test the person beside them. And according to the story, everybody with the vitamin C could stay strong and the NutraSweet couldn't. And I thought, wow, there's got to be something to this. You know, that's a, anyway, so uh, that's when I decided I would do the course. But what he, what he discovered when he had brought these students in was that uh, around lesson 77 or something like that, there was a psychic shift in their in their physicality that that they were not afraid of anything that the fear had had gone they didn't know it but it was apparently it was gone so i thought well i'm gonna i'm gonna pull that off the shelf so january the first i pulled it down and did the lessons three there's 365 lessons in the course that you do every day and i used to write it on a piece of 
uh, paper and stick it in my pocket. And used to have to look at it every hour or something like that. I did that right straight through to December 31st, and that was that. I finished the course. So it was like I I treated it like I didn't I didn't try and get all caught up in all the language and all the you know the. Um, I call it like a religion. A lot of people are into it for the spirituality and stuff. Anyway, so <laughs> I was all done with the course. But then during that period of time, I ran into all these uh, people. And one of them ended up to be the woman that supposedly <laughs> broke up the marriage. You know, this is a story. But so I spent a number of years with her traveling around to different um, Course in Miracles uh, people uh, and staying at Course in Miracles people in Costa Rica and, and the West Coast and Edmonton. And uh, so I was, but I w was not interested in the course at all. It was like a, you know, it's a course and you've done the course, you've done the course. But anyway, so that's my Course in Miracles story. Oh, thank you, Robert. Now you say, um, just while we're on the subject, it's uh, some of my favorite quotes from ACIM. And these uh, are from your book, but they're obviously from the Course in Miracles. It says, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. So lies the peace of God. I wonder uh, if we could discuss that one just briefly, if you don't mind. Yeah, I've, I've, I've morphed into, there's really nothing real now, you know what I mean? So, so that, at the time, that, that seemed to make a lot of sense, but not anymore. Like a lot of things. <laughs> well, I think it's like you said, there's, um, there's no separate independent entity. There's only this character. So there's nothing real. There's no real Robert in there that could be threatened it's right. just just the appearance uh just this persona if you will mm -hmm. um you you see you also quote this one uh you and i give everything all the meaning it has yeah i like that one that one's a, that one's a keeper you know people will understand that and you know, <laughs> um nothing really has any meaning uh, unless you know unless it's given to it so uh, i i like that one yeah we are the meaning makers yeah <laughs> yeah i guess that's pretty much says it that's a that's a powerful one um that we assign meaning to things but in and of themselves they don't apart from thinking <laughs> they, it doesn't mean anything nothing is about what it appears to be yeah it's kind of the same thing how about every encounter is a holy encounter yeah I'm, I'm, <laughs> well you know if you, if you can turn that around and and kind of look at it from a non-dual point of point of view is that there isn't anybody to encounter so everything uh, the holy part i, I don't i don't you know, buy into that anymore, but um, you could, you know, you and I apparently talking to me, this, there's only one conversation. There's no, there's not really two people conversing. So um, anyway, that's oh, it's uh, like that story from your book where uh, the, the two people sitting at a bar, you were sitting at the bar and everything they were saying was them and they and they. Yeah, and, yeah. And they, and you ask them who them and they and those yeah <laughs> and you said uh, what if them and they are we and us yeah yeah that's powerful yeah. so when you were teaching uh, hawkins cuz you you talk a lot in there about um you be, you became partners using the principles of the map of consciousness as a platform and you worked as a team in toronto london and windsor coaching senior and junior executives, owners and managers of companies in transition using uh, the map of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, in transition, 
uh, after selling the business, I hired a coach, Jonathan, and we spent a year trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life, you know, and we would do all these whiteboards and crap like that. Finally, it, it came down to I should get back into business again. And anyway, so we parted ways and I started a whole bunch of different businesses. So Jazz Blues Club. Um, or, excuse me. Um, printing business, uh, offshore investment business. You know, there was four or five different businesses that I'd started, natural health supplement business. And uh, for, for about five or six years, and I ran into Jonathan when he was uh, launching his book called Leap, L-E-A-P. And we reconnected and he said, like, why don't you come and join me? He's, he was a coach. Of course, I always said that. <laughs> and uh, so why don't you come and join me? Uh, and, and we can team up. And he said, I've got all these different contacts and whatnot. So my whole thing with him was that I was I came from the standpoint of been there, done that. And, and I understood the entrepreneur's mindset. And so I, I didn't really have to say all that much because it was an understanding, you know, and I just throw the, a few words in here and there. And we coached uh, 200 and, or two or 300 different executives in Toronto and Windsor and, and London. And um, when I would sit down with a, with a person, uh, an individual, we, we used to take one-on-ones. Uh, I would sit down and I wouldn't, I wouldn't see their story. I, do, I, I, do, I would just, I wouldn't see that there was anybody there <laughs> other than, you know, a, a body and so on. And it just seemed like it was understood by the, the other person that they, their story was meaningless. And it, it just cut through all of that stuff. And, and it, at the end of the thing, <laughs> everybody come up and thank me. I really didn't say much. I would just sort of sit there and not, not buy into anything because it, it wasn't real anyway, you know? So anyway, that's the coaching business. That lasted for about three years, two or three years, something like that, until Valerie, the woman who broke up my marriage, she wanted to be part of it. And anyway, that didn't work. So that was the coaching business. Well, there was something in there where you had people right down there. So oh wow that that was that was later oh, okay. um when valerie and i started doing the kind of similar thing under hawkins stuff um and we had a we had a uh retreat set up in uh, one of the islands anyway and uh so the first night you, you, first night was a, was a, was a three-day thing friday night you you bring everybody in and you explain what you're what you're doing and blah blah blah. So I brought everybody in, or we did, and and I had them write out, write out who they were on a piece of paper, like you know their history, their who their parents are, what they like, all that, and hand it in the next day. So they took it to the room. They came back the next day, and they they handed them in, and every one of them I. I I had to stand up and I crumple each one of my <laughs> I said, so who are you now? <laughs> you know. Anyway, we, we lost a couple really quick. Uh, but then the ones that stayed, we, we had a good time for the rest of the weekend. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Like, who would you be without your story? It just, it just <laughs> came to me. I, you know, I, it's like... Um, well, I think most people are like that, that they really depend on their past and their family and all that as who they are. You know? mm. so. Yeah, identity is yeah. very important <laughs> to a person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you had many insights along the way. One of them was uh, all the faces I had met earlier in the day were also simply playing a part but I had been getting caught up in taking the story seriously. 
As I relaxed, a very thin, bright, seemingly electrified light surrounded Don until the game started again. So it was during a game, he he, he looked like animated and everything looked. Yeah. Do you know Don Cherry? Have you heard of him? No. He's a he's a hockey okay color commentator guy. Yeah, he was wore these outlandish costumes and stuff. You know. Anyway. Uh, I don't really watch hockey either, but I was sitting there and my partner's father's, we were sitting at his place and he was watching the game. And I, I just happened to, at intermission, I happened to look up and see Don. And it was just like this, I have no idea what you could describe it, but it was like a, everything was surrounded by this light, this Don, the TV, everybody in the room. It was like a uh, light or a bright light around them, like a halo. And this continued on after he, we went back to our, our, our let me think now, like maybe we weren't staying at his place that time anyway. And it lasted about an hour or so, um, and it went away. But uh, I never, I didn't say anything to anybody. It was just around the ice license plates on the cars in front of us it was it was like <laughs> i don't know it's just like a psychedelic experience it's like i was on drugs or something you know what do you make of this word uh transmission it says uh um, yeah which means the really wise ones like maharaj um, uh, papaji or rajneesh under certain certain circumstances, could transmit this elusive truth and awaken some of their disciples. Yeah, well, of course, that was a belief that people had. I didn't really believe it that much, and, but uh, uh, I, I, gurus to me were. Um, I didn't take anybody as an authority on anything, especially spirituality. I, the message, the message was the message, and. It might have come through Muji, it might have come through Papaji, or, but I, I didn't give them any credit for anything, you know? So, uh, what were we talking about? Just uh, transmission. Uh, oh, yeah, transmission, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> it was just, it was just comical that, that this thing, like, he, he looks like, like Osho, remember Osho? Yes. Okay. Well, Don Cherry, the way he dressed was almost like an Osho guy, like just outrageous, you know. Oh, I see. <laughs> you also talk about this uh, vortex. Uh, oh, yeah. in, in Sedona. Sedona, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we flew out to have a, a meeting with uh, David Hawkins and... Uh, we were in town at one of these uh, <laughs> one of these shops that have incense going and uh, Kenny G music and you know <laughs> uh, uh, so called spiritual shop. Anyway, the woman in there she said uh, there's a, a book or a pamphlet on on the, all these vortexes around Sedona. They're supposed to be special places, you know. So she told us to look out for the <clears throat> for the one by the airport because it's male and it was electric energy. And the rest of them were female energy, all that stuff. Okay, fine. So we did Hawkins talk, and then on the way back to the airport, so we look at that. It's right. It's right here. Let's pull over. So we pull over. We walk into the desert. And three of us, these business guys, were sitting there, you know, <laughs> like <legs> crossed, <laughs> waiting for something to happen. <laughs> and about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, uh, one of the guys says, anybody feel anything? Nope. What about you, Bob? Nope. Okay, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> that was that. That was that, uh, yeah. How about uh, <clears throat> Carl Jung? You said he was one of your favorites. Yeah, uh, philosophy-wise, he was. Uh, him and J. Krishnamurti, I thought, had a lot kind of in common. 
in terms of the way they, um, you know, they were kind of in a, in a deeper look at at uh, the psychic of individuals and stuff. So uh, yeah, I uh, I enjoyed his stuff. Yeah. How about um, Edgar Casey? Yeah, well, we stayed at uh, Edgar Casey is a big organization, just like the Course in Miracles organization. And in Canada, they had uh, the president of Edgar Casey Canada invited us up to his place a few times, this remote area. And I would have these dreams, <laughs> really wild dreams when I would ever have stayed there. Um, and the next morning he would analyze the dreams and tell us what it meant and stuff like that. That's what Edgar Casey did basically, but he'd do it, he'd do it over the phone and he'd be laying on his back with his eyes closed when he was <laughs> giving instructions. But anyway, and we went down, we went down to, to um, Virginia Beach and worked at the youth camp and stuff like that. Cool. And then uh, you got into Ramesh Balsakar and yeah. you, you say he was asking questions such as, did you create your body or brain? Did you create any of your interests, urges or talents? Have you ever had the experience of actually directing your existence? And you said, <clears throat> excuse me, as I considered these questions, it became absurdly obvious that I had not created any of my physical or mental abilities or lack of abilities, nor any needs, interests, urges, and concerns. I also read how science had discovered that thoughts are not generated from the inert gray matter we call the brain, and that a thought comes into the brain almost six seconds before anyone takes action on the thoughts. So thoughts were definitely not my thoughts, just thoughts. Therefore, it made total logical sense that I could not have created any of my apparent actions. And oops, everything is simply the movement of life or nature. So can you say anything about um, your experience with Ramesh and some of those? Concepts? Yeah, yeah. His book, Consciousness Speaks, um, I think that's his book, yeah, um, was, was where I sort of had this epiphany about, about thoughts and so on. And it was right after that that it seemed to spawn the, um, the writing of my book. And it, it became absurdly obvious that I wasn't actually writing the book. The book was getting written, and I was hold, or seemed to be holding a pen and all of that stuff, but it was just the way it was coming through and onto the page, and I, I, I just, I had no, <laughs> you know, it was completely autonomous, so I wasn't doing anything. So that went on for quite a while until the book was finished. In fact... I think it got to a hundred pages and that's when I, something hit and I said, that, that's enough, but a hundred pages is it. So, uh, published that one and uh, tried to sell it, sold a few, gave more away, but, uh, it was, um, like I say, it was the, the writing of the book. <sighs> If you want to call it illuminating, it's illuminating because I wasn't doing it. So uh, that it's just one of those um, one of those experiences that kind of laid the platform for kind of the rest of my delve into non-duality, if you want to call it that. As uh, Ramesh really was a spiritual teacher, sort of. Thing. So to speak. So it uh, kind of started gravitating towards towards the uh, non-dual or the uncom uncompromising non-dual message because that to me was just it felt like I was at home whenever I would be in the presence of like a Tony Parsons or uh, or Jim Newman or, or uh, 
Andreas. We had them all out to the West Coast, <clears throat> excuse me, here. And uh, just, it, it just juice is so juicy uh, in terms of its energy that uh, it's undeniable as far as I'm concerned. There's no teaching there. Yeah, I agree. You also spent some time with um, Wayne Lickerman. Oh, yeah, Wayne. <laughs> yeah, he's a character, too. Did you ever meet Wayne? I have, yeah. Okay, yeah. I so went to one one retreat once. He came Did to you? Massachusetts, and I went. And Did I, you? Yeah, and I met him. That was about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He Well, he came to um, South Spring Island when I was doing the bed and breakfast thing there. And he... Uh, some of the, some of his followers stayed at our at our place, and I went to one or two of the talks. Uh, oh yeah, I asked, or somebody asked him, <laughs> "How does it feel to be enlightened?" <laughs> and he said, "How does it feel not to have a pebble in your shoe?" <laughs> yeah, I like that one too, because uh, it's. A it's an absence, uh, so to speak. So it's hard to, it's not like there's something new and new well, approved thing going on here. It's just, <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's not a feeling basically, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you say, uh, wow, that makes, I'm sorry. That means no one is making anything happen. And right. nobody can become awakened or enlightened. This Robert mm. character is but a fleeting appearance. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way you put that. A fleeting appearance. Um, let's see what's next here. Oh, so you had a lot uh, uh, with Muji on here. Yeah. You, know, you wrote yeah. a letter to him. He wrote you back. Um, yeah. Well, what, what, once, I, once I gave away my last penny on the streets in Victoria, was homeless. Uh, we didn't get to that story, but that's fine. Um, Muji, somehow I, I uh, became enthralled with him, or at least, you know, the energy there. And I used to go to the library every, every day with my little laptop. I had a laptop computer, and I had some clothes and a suitcase, and that was that was it. So I'd go to the library and use their their uh, internet and watch his videos constantly, and maybe somebody else too, but mostly mostly Muji. And then um, I had these so-called dark nights of the soul uh, a couple of times on the street, and the one time I was walking back to the Salvation Army where I had a cot there and all of a sudden this rage <laughs> I threw my bag down and I went to the nearest um, Starbucks and uh, emailed Muji that you know please help and you've taken away all my possessions you've taken away my 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 fiance, you've taken away this, you've taken away that. Please help. I I don't know where to turn. And all this stuff. Anyway, he he emailed me almost right away, even though it was in England. You know, big difference in time. And said, find out who it is that is losing everything. <laughs> Basically, you know, oh, I know. I think it was. Can the seer be seen? Was was his big thing? What can the seer be seen? He said, and I said, that's that's been rolling around in my consciousness for a long time. And he said, well, find out who that is and get back to me. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that was that. But then, uh, let's see. I got off the street. I was in I was in uh, one of the islands, Bowen Island. I was running. I, I was hired as. Uh, manager of a retreat center there. And so I was starting to make some money. They were paying me, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, 
So I, I got a credit card and a, a line of credit and all this stuff. And I, so I arranged a flight over to, um, over to London to, to see Muji at a, week, a weekend retreat. And it was, there was a letter came came across that he was anybody that's coming from a long distance he would personally see them at a private meeting on the second day or something like that. I thought, oh, that sounds cool. I, you know, <laughs> so there was uh, he used to have his meetings at a church in Brixton, and I would. Um, so I, I finally got there, and there was a lineup. Uh, this the day that he was supposed to be giving these private private meetings, I had seen he he was he gave his talk at another place. Anyway, the, this private meeting thing was to take place in the church. And I thought, Jesus, time to get through all these people. <laughs> anyway, I went to the top of the hill, and I I knew his his uh, condo was right there, or his townhouse. And all of his, you know, minions were milling around. And I thought, well, I could just wait here and he'd have to go by me and we could have a little chat, whatever. The mind's going like that. And finally, I just all of a sudden got up and walked away. I was like, okay, I guess I don't have to see Muji. <laughs> I got on the plane and what was that? <laughs> That was funny. You felt like the seeking had ended. Well, I I don't know if I felt that way, but it was like I didn't need to see him to, for any reason other than, well, I just didn't need to see him. So what did that mean? Well, maybe the seeking had ended. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really consider myself a seeker anyway, but that's, that's another story. Um, I think it's, I've always kind of been, <laughs> I've always been this way. And I, I, I don't see any, anything that has to be gotten or changed in what's happening. So um, you call that not seeking? I don't know. I love the energy of the, of the non-dual message, and I, I don't really listen to the words per se. I do, I guess, but I, it's not really the words anyway, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, <laughs> can't be. The word is never the thing. Yeah. The Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let me ask you a question. Sure. <laughs> You're in Boston, right? I am. Are you a sports fan? Uh, not really. Not really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you got the Boston Celtics, the Red Sox. And on the weekend, they had the U.S. Open golf in Boston. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we watched it for like 20 hours or something like that. I've only been there once myself. <clears throat> oh, well, we have a great sports city and uh, yeah. a lot of amazing teams, obviously, yeah, pa Patriots and uh, yeah, Celtics. Patriots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you used to talk about carpe diem a lot, <laughs> and uh, you wrote in here one day feeling a little frisky. I wrote a note on, and stuck it on the rock. Leave the day alone. From my new perspective, I have zero control over the day or what the day appears to have in store. I have zero expectations of the way the day should be or could be. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, the woman that, that owned the retreat center, I used to, well, I did the groundskeeping and all kinds of work, but she had a pond outside of her residence and has, she had this rock, Carpe Diem, sitting there, and that's when I put the note on there. <laughs> Just Anyway, when she was firing me, she brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> all right so how about daryl bailey you had a a friendship oh, with him yeah yeah daryl is a great guy um yeah um how did that work out 
I forget, ran across him and somehow man, uh, flew out to Winnipeg from from Victoria to Winnipeg is a you know about a four hour flight. Anyway, um, and spent uh, the weekend with him. He wrote uh, a number of books. Um, uh, did I say in there what the books were? I can't remember now. I think Dis one one is dismantling different. dismantling the man the the fantasy that yes, yes. big one yeah yeah and we had a great time they um, we <laughs> the weather was minus forty or some damn thing and uh, we walked back and forth to his um, his meeting and chat and whatnot um, yeah and he, he did a, a zoom or not a zoom but a what's the other one for you. Before Zoom, anyway. Skype? Or Skype, that's it. Uh, for our group, our non-dual group in, uh, in Victoria at the K-Center. And uh, I think he did two, maybe. Excuse me. And uh, yeah, so we stayed in touch. But, but actually, had kind of a bit of a falling out because I, I wasn't buying into some of his stuff just didn't gel, you know what I mean? And we'd have a back and forth and email and stuff and finally well, I, may i ask what i don't I, know I, i'm uh, fairly familiar with his what he yeah says, i so. don't i don't know it's a, it just didn't ring uh it just didn't have the energy of the you know i can't remember details okay. it was like um well i know he talks a lot about the how nothing is permanent, first of all, and and that, oh yeah, yeah, no, and and basically that um, life is just what's unfolding, what's uh, appearing, what's yeah. in the immediacy. I mean, yeah. he might not use those words, but I yeah. think he's saying essentially what most radical non-dual. Yeah, uh, no, I agree. Uh, he he wrote a poem called "This uh, Just This" or something like that. And it was really well done, and but it was a after our meetups, our one to our meetup uh, that we had on Zoom is it was just something that wasn't resonating here, and I don't know what I can't remember what it was now, but it was uh, it was just something not quite, you know. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I didn't I know. know. I didn't know if I could draw the yeah. memory, but uh, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, no, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I, I liked how we described how you know basically what we just were talking about. Words are not the thing. Yeah. La labels. He said you could change the name of something, and but it doesn't change. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's all it's all good stuff. Uh, yeah. You you write um, that you remember that there was a time. Well, I'll just read the way it's written. When I would attempt to put a positive spin on almost everything, it seems that just isn't necessary anymore. Things are what they are, or at least what they appear to be. The glass is as it is. Lots of wine, some wine, or just a drop in the bottom. But I usually top it up before it gets too far down the glass. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's beautiful. And I think it's also describing what we're saying that um, there's no need to put a positive spin on everything. Right. Can you no. say more about that positivity? Yeah. Well, again, that's the, that's the personal development thing. Uh, seeing everything as, you know, the glass half full and, and uh, you know, talk, doing the mantras, the, the talking, you know, talking yourself into being positive instead of negative, and, uh, which, you know, that's fine. It, it just, um, uh, it's it's it just you're trying to develop something that doesn't exist <laughs> yeah and um you had a fondness for leonard cohen leonard i love leonard um actually kenneth madden and leonard had uh, uh, you know uh, kenneth talked about him a little bit but he uh, he was friends with Ramesh Balsakar as well. He had he had gone to some of his satsangs in India, and he was also 
stayed at Mount Baldy uh, for, I don't know, a few years, I guess, at, in a uh, Zen monastery. But um, no, he's got, he's got a beautiful energy about him, and I love his work, his songs. It's actually poetry that he sings. So. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Everything appearing in this play of life is a perfect expression of existence. And I don't feel any need to change it or desire for it to be different than it appears to be. I am not for or against any so-called cause. And I also find no fault with those who apparently need to take part in these activities. Nothing needs healing or forgiveness. If anything, I guess you could say I'm pro this. Yeah, it kind of says it. Um, when I was in the course, um, I would go to these meetings and they'd be always talking about forgiveness, you know, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. I just didn't get that at all. What's to forgive and who's to forgive it? You know? <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, probably, you know, a lot of people think I'm nuts. Maybe. I don't know. But then a lot of people, I don't really talk about this to almost almost anybody. It just, it comes up once in a while. But, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about uh, Peter Tazubian? Oh, know. yeah. Right. Can you hang on just a second? Yeah, you want to pause? I'll pause it. Let me okay. The... Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just, I went to my bookshelf. I've got like four or five books on my bookshelf. This is Dayton, uh, Bailey's uh, second book, I believe. You have to hold it up a little higher. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. There we go. Yeah. Essence Revisited. Yeah, I like that one. Anyway, Peter, Peter wrote this, apparently. Consciousness is all. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I kept it. I don't even look at it. But here's my, here's the only book, I, or only copy of one I. Oh, I like your story, how you got the cover art, too. Yeah, that was cool. Um, I've, got, I've got it here, actually. Um, I was looking at, through the internet to find a picture of, you know, the God and Adam thing, the fingers. Yeah. And I, I found the one with, <laughs> with the thumb. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's, that's perfect and i got a hold of the artist and he had retired and didn't want anything to do with it and I sent i sent him a manuscript of the book and so a week later he gets back to me he says he says i love your book he says uh it's probably the best uh, whatever i read on the subject and he says, I'll do anything you want for the book. Uh, it's a free of charge. He says, I'll, I'll find out where the picture is. And anyway, that was fun. We, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> and um, so you, you delved into that book. Uh, yeah, well, I Pete, was Peter. really into it. Uh, it just uh, somehow spoke to me. Well, I don't know how I go. I was into Rupert Spira at that time. Um, and he he suggested it as a he called it a finishing book. In other words, like you know, this is gonna this is gonna cut your head off or whatever. But um, and I got talking to Peter about doing some coaching and whatnot. That never happened. Um, but it, his. This whole thing was coming from this. What did this look like? <laughs> sort of, right? <laughs> so, um, and so, anyway, it's it's still a, a dual, uh, you know, duality book. But I enjoyed it. Anyway, how about um, Douglas Harding? Used to oh, teach, Douglas, used yeah, to do those exercises. Yeah, the, yeah, the headless way. Yeah, you want to say headless about? way. Douglas and the Headless Way? Well, yeah. Um, forget the guy's name, but his number one guy. Um, oh, Richard, anyway. Richard Lang? Richard. Richard Lang, yeah. 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 Uh, 
Yeah, we we had uh, a number of meetings. Uh, I really I really enjoyed it. It was like a it was like the person could tell that he wasn't there by using these these methods or these principles. And people used to get a real charge out of it. Um, and I had I had one of my guys had spent some time with with uh, with him when he was alive, and so he used to help me do these do these uh, exercises. Um, but again, that that was that, that just fell by the wayside after a while. Uh, it, it, it was just a kind of a realization that there's still somebody around <laughs> who was not there. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. As you say, it became obvious the entire universe is emanating from an empty space I am looking out of. Yeah. It's a nice way yeah. to put it. Of course, there's no one looking out, but. Um... Well, I had these experiences. I'd, ride, I'd be riding my bike and uh, all of a sudden it would start raining. <laughs> the thought came, well, you know, it's not raining here. <laughs> it was like it's it seems to be raining but it's not raining here wherever here was so uh yeah that was that was fun yeah. you said that helped make sense of uh saint, yeah. saint francis is what you are looking for is where you're looking from and Muji's yeah. can the seer be seen yeah yeah it made it, it brought it into a perspective were uh as close as close as damn is to swearing if you want to say it that way um with uh, this character uh reinforcing the fact that there's nobody looking out of the eyes basically and uh, no nobody looking back at you as well <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know Douglas Harding. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, the book. Yeah. I mean, I know he well, has he, a, he has a few the, books, but um, he's had this book on the universe, or I forget what it's called, but, uh, where where he completely dismantles the all of the science around planets and you know and, and uh, matter and so on like that. Uh, it was, it's quite a book. It's like 800 pages or something. Okay. <laughs> the only book I read was on having no head. And yeah. I, I did some of the exercises. I It wasn't my thing, but well, I, I gave it a shot. Uh, yeah. Douglas's wife was doing those for a bit too. Yeah. Um, yeah, they used to do it as a team, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was familiar with Richard and her, of course, Douglas was before my time. Um, I believe. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. So you write in terms of uh, dual mind labels and relating or relationship. You write from a non-dual perspective. I am always relating to myself in an apparently separate temporary expression. Actually, better said, there is only what's apparently happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like that, but you know, it's it's obvious it isn't. And uh, <clears throat> so the, it seems like you've always been in a some kind of a role, like organizing groups or facilitating. Um, you you wrote you became an organizer of non duality and new beginnings meetup group, and yeah. um, you really started to carry this message in a way mm -hmm. yeah in a way so what can you say about like how you've always been drawn to those kind of roles of uh organizer I, and facilitator and I, I don't know i mean it just seems to be my nature to leader to, yeah i guess so you know like uh quietly leading i don't i don't, I don't have a interest in uh any of the raw raw stuff you know but uh, somehow it it just seems to funnel the interest seems to funnel into this character and uh, the the meetup group and I don't know the 
lots and lots and lots of leader roles, different leader roles. Yeah. Yeah. I see that because it seems like whatever was interesting you at the time, whether it was self-help or uh, mm-hmm. uh, like I said, Muji or Eckhart, like you would get involved in groups and, mm-hmm. and organizing things around it. Yeah. Um, so you got, uh, I think we're nearing the end and it says, um, So you started to become reflective on the story. Uh, You said, having reread the entire story, what stands out is the shift from trying to get at one with the flow of life to realizing I was never apart from the flow ever. This flow is empty of meaning and purpose, a miraculous explosion of color and sound, the extraordinary appearing as ordinary, no thing appearing as everything unintentional perfection, unconditional love, simply this. Wow. I like the way you put that. And you say some apparent changes have been noticed. Uh, Can you tell me about what apparent changes have been noticed? Well, that was five years ago. Uh, Well, you know, Hey, the ch- the chatter, it can be chatter going on. There can be, uh, you know, uh, projection of what might happen or, or uh, making up stories about what just happened. <laughs> but none of it is real. None of it is serious. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. So, um I guess I don't know. I, I, I re, you know what I really enjoy now is is uh, posting on on the Facebook page <laughs> and, and, and catching out guys that are trying to teach something. <laughs> I just love it. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. I actually, there was a weird situation. Uh, I'm not sure you're aware that this even happened, but um, my friend had passed away and his older brother um, has a page called the Boston Buddha. He teaches um, Mm -hmm. mind mindfulness. And I said something on his page. And then I noticed you had said something on his page. And and I thought, there's no way Robert knows who this is. No, (laughs) he's only commenting on there because I am. Um, yeah. Well, you don't Probably. know. You can't Probably. know my friend Andy from North no. Massachusetts, but no. um, and you said something about well, no one chooses or this kind, of, and I was like, oh, Robert, like, you know, it seemed a little evangelical to go out. Like, I see if someone's posting on your page, then you want to correct them or whatever. <laughs> but like, it seems like sometimes you go out to other people's stuff. Not really, not much, unless it come, unless I see it somewhere. Like yeah, it, yeah. It must have come across my stuff, or I wouldn't have seen it, you know? Yeah, well, I think when your friends co- comment on someone's thing, it shows up in some way. Okay. It's some weird, huh. weird thing. But I guess what I'm, what I want to ask you about that is, um, is that, you know, this has been called a response. Mm-hmm. Or it's a... Um, you know, in other words, like I never speak about this unless somebody is asking me directly mm-hmm. or, or engaging me in some way. But um, so I wonder, what is that about that kind of zealousness that you seem to have? You know what? I have no idea why <laughs> I do anything. <laughs> it's like George Carlin. I lo- love his saying. He says, I have, he says, I don't know what the heck's going on. I wouldn't know what to do about it if I did. <laughs> yes. I don't have a clue. Um, well, what you say in terms of changes, and I guess you said this four years ago, this came out. Uh, uh, 16, 2016. That's more than four years. You say the so-called screen of conditioned 
mind and its reactions and interpretations to what's happening seems to have dissolved. And without this screen trying to protect me, feelings and emotions seem much more powerful, but short-lived. They appear and disappear like flashes from out of nowhere. There's a childlike wonder at the millions of tiny water droplets on the leaves after a rain, watching hummingbirds dance and chase each other. The warmth of the sun and cool breeze on the skin. The miracle of daily activity while appearing, apparently sitting by the fountain in Tuscany Village, listening to the water cascading, the conversations in the diverse languages, observing cars and people moving about with the precision of an exquisitely rehearsed play. Nicely said. It's very poetic. Yeah, funny. I, I can't remember that, but I guess it's, yeah, I'm, it's in the book. Yeah. 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 yeah everyone's going to want this book now. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to push it out there. This, this robber character, the one in the mirror, seems to get up to all sorts of mischief. And although it may look like I'm moving about while driving or riding my bike from my perspective, everything else is on the move but me. I am the unmoved space or capacity for the world to happen. Yeah, that's that's Harding stuff. Oh, that's nice. Well, we'll just end with, uh, with this here. It says, <clears throat> contemplating the end of the story, the thought came, what the heck constitutes the ending or beginning of any event? Whether it be a life story of a fictional character named Robert or any other appearance, all events depend on never pr present time and the coming together of all apparent actions, reactions and interactions since the so-called Big Bang. However, from here, there is no actual physical universe out there, apart from the sense perceptions. There is no past way back there that the Big Bang could have happened. Birth and death take place in the same place, here now. I suppose some might argue that in the story of me, the beginning would be at birth, event, or this Robert body. But when does the actual birth begin? Does it start as an energetic twinkle in Harry's eye or the little bang of Harry and Agnes's orgasm from a non-dual perspective? There never was a beginning to this or any event. All apparent beginnings and endings are really one seamless flow. So in fact, there is nothing happening, no birth, no death, no life. Just this, just this. What a miraculous, omnipresent, omnipotent, potent, <laughs> omniscient, Loving this, omnipotent, yeah, omniscient. I remember those words, yeah. And there you go. And there's jo uh, Robert the Jokester right at the end. What a, what a beautiful book, Robert. <laughs> you want to say yeah. anything uh, about birth and death and here and now and all that stuff I just read? Not really. That, you said it all. <laughs> well, okay. Well, uh, if there's anything you want to leave the listener with as far as they, where they can find you or um, anything else you'd like to say before we wrap it up. I don't have a website. Um, the uh, email is robertkegan at hotmail.com. Uh, All right. Well, thank you, Robert. This was a delight. I enjoyed reading the book and discussing it with you. Thank you very much. It was a lot I appreciate of fun. It. Thank yeah. you so much. I'll I'll take, see you around. All right. Take care, buddy. Okay. Okay, buddy. Bye.